David Tall, CEO of Verse.io, back in the house. Welcome back to the Sales Podcast, man. How the heck are you? I am great. Good to see you again, Wes. So I'm going to, I'll direct everyone. It was a year and three months. I went and looked it up. So episode, where are my notes? Episode 551, using artificial intelligence to grow your sales efficiently. Um, so I'll let everybody go back, go listen to that. Uh, had your story of uh, real estate, right? It was it you, you and your brother. That's right. Right. Uh, kind of qualifying leads and um, you'd create it. Uh, my agent finder. Uh, that grew. Um, then they started asking you to kind of qualify their leads. And then you just began expanding into more industries, but then adding humans into AI, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, we we were kind of early on the AI train, trying to leverage uh, everything that technology has to offer and to help with automation and 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 do it in an authentic way. And, you know, we we realized that, you know, humans alone to solve problems um, can be expensive, hard to manage, hard to train, inefficient, um, unpredictable, inconsistent. And uh, but technology alone also has some limitations, even with AI, it can be inauthentic. And so we really believe that the that the real kind of key here to unlock the best customer experience is how do you bridge the best of both of those worlds? How do you bridge technology with people and create you know superhuman experience uh, or superhuman customer experiences? Yeah, you know I'm the president of our HOA, and um, it's like it's a nice community, and we're on the outskirts of town, so technically like we're in the county, we're outside of the city limits. Um, so we, we fall under the sheriffs, right? So we don't have city police. Uh, and so for years we've had kids hop in the fence and they jump in the pool, you know, no vandalism, no theft. I mean, they're just teenagers wanting to sit in the hot tub after hours. Right. And parents, and so they have been a little rowdier in the last year or so, but like, you know, playing loud music, cursing as they eat junk food. But I mean, it's like, it's not Compton, right? I mean, and, but people have freaked out. And so we've looked at getting gates, new gates, high, you know, higher fences, blah, blah, blah. Everything's brutally expensive. So we're getting, we're, we're doing a combination of things, but we're getting these high def cameras that are run by, monitored by AI, but they have human backup right so these cameras are going to zoom in they're going to alert you know after hours turn on lights uh we've got some uh, um, audible warnings and then it kicks it over to a human you know so i mean we're, we're going to pay for this monitoring uh you know and subscription and um it's expensive but it's less expensive than a new gate it's less expensive than paying security guards all the time so i guess that's the perfect mix huh Humans plus tech. <laughs> yeah, and if you if you kind of just look at the evolution of society and 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 how technology has been infused into all different aspects of our lives, it's it's been there to give humans more leverage, to do more with less, to be more efficient, to 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 be able to multitask and and do more things at once. And there are places absolutely where technology can just do it entirely. Um, yeah. And there are areas and certain use cases in the world where it's really about bringing that leverage to, to the human experience. And, and when we look at, uh, think about, you know, pilots and, and just flying a plane, it used to be entirely, you know, mechanical and human powered. Um, and that had its limitations and its risks. Uh, and then technology came along and with GPS and, and all sorts of radar and, and, you know, now, you know, they can kind of set a, a course and, and the plane could take off and pretty much get there on its own, but it has that, human backup, right? Because in those experiences, is we value the safety of that, of having the human backup. Um, and I think yeah. it's the same with other kinds of experiences when it comes to how you're talking to your customers. Uh, are you afraid of the AI might go on a whole rant uh, un uncontrollably? So there are guardrails we want to bring into place with certain kinds of conversations. There are other kinds of conversations where a simple chat bot might just be able to do one or two quick things, and that's good enough too. And so I think that the answer isn't one or the other. It's what are you really trying to solve and what resources and technology is there to help you accomplish that in a better way? 
So you know, I always say like in, in technology, te- te- technology years are like dog years. So even though it's only been 15 months since we chatted, uh, how much have things changed in, in this world? Well, you know, you, you've seen, you know, with, with, with chat GPT and, and all the la- large uh, language models, the LLMs and the generative AI solutions coming out, every company seems to be popping up uh, around them now and, and all the big, you know, the big players, Google, Amazon, Facebook, um, OpenAI are all, are all uh, coming out with their own versions of this Microsoft. So, uh, you know, we, we've, as an AI company, we, we've, we've, we've been tapping into that for many years. We've already, you know, integrated all these uh, LLMs and, and, and generative AI solutions into what we do at Verse to, to leverage and to automate as much as we can for our customers. We work with large brands that are having tens of thousands or millions of conversations a year with consumers, and we can help automate what hundreds or thousands of humans would have to be doing. And we can do this with, with AI, and that's powerful. Um, and so I think that um, it's it's advancing really quickly, and it's it's also just becoming more accessible. I'd say that's the biggest thing is a lot of this has been around. It's not new to companies like Verse and, and others that have kind of been on this train. Um, but what is happening is it's it's becoming more um, use, you know, there's a user interface being introduced now, you know, when you go to chat GPT, you can, you can prompt it yourself and, and kind of see how it works and use it. And so we've told all of our employees to, to sign up for it and use it. Um, just, just in how they write emails to customers, uh, and help writing an email to a potential, even an investor. Uh, I hope our investors aren't listening. But I've definitely used it. Um, you know, I wrote a, a, a poem to my wife for her birthday. I hope my wife isn't listening. But um, I, I think there are a lot of powerful ways people can use it. Our engineers are, are using it, as I'm sure every engineer that's at the forefront of technology is leveraging it now to, to accelerate development and some coding. Um, so I, what's, what's really fascinating is just how fast, like you were talking about dog years, but I think it's, it's faster than that. Um, yeah. it, because uh, there, there's already such a large infrastructure of solutions, of marketing platforms, of different technology platforms. And now what you're doing is you're, you know, you're, you're now kind of adding that fuel to that fire. So, you know, embedding, uh, you know, a, a, a GPT or LLM and generative AI solution to, um, Google or hyper accelerate what that can do or to, you know, Bing, right? Which which we're finally talking about again. How how long was it that we weren't really talking about Bing? Um, and um, yeah, I, you know, so a friend of mine is really good in the um, paid marketing specifically, but he's just a great entrepreneur overall, Justin Brooke. I've had him on the show a couple of times, and he I remember not too long ago he was talking about um, the oh I got to pull it up. What what's their browser called? Edge, right? Microsoft Edge. Yep. He was like, man, I'm I'm Microsoft Edge and Bing. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> and I've started using it. So I keep I keep Chrome on uh one side and I keep Chrome with Google and I keep Chrome or uh, Safari with Bing on the other page. And I, I have Microsoft Edge. I don't know. I haven't, I mean, do I need three browsers? Can I can I use Microsoft? Just get rid of Chrome. So I don't know, but I do like the search results and experience better through Bing. Yeah, it's interesting. And 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 I think all of these companies are are still learning and sure. and machine learning itself and and AI itself is going to come to the to solve it even further as as consumers become more adept uh on on how to use it and how to leverage it. Um and I think there's going to be all sorts of different interfaces, apps, uh different platforms that's now being embedded into into you know Google Sheets and Microsoft Office and 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 other platforms, which I, I think is going to be really interesting. And then with ChatGPT four and others with you know APIs that you're going to be able to tap into and and call applications and and make web calls with it and and kind of run different sequences. I think it's it's going to really transform so much more. I think we're just scratching the surface, and I think the next ten years of this. I mean, when we look back and we have this conversation on episode, you know, 2,982, <laughs> looking back on on whatever number you're at right now, um, 
it, it's we're not going to recognize it. I, sure. I really think we're not going to recognize it. Um, but how how can people use it today, right? Because things in the future are great, um, but what can people do today to stand out? Because part of my fear, and I'm kind of experiencing it now, but as people do get better with using these tools, they, they can communicate better. Machines get faster. APIs get better. Uh, we're, we're inundated even more. And then, of course, the, the spammers and the, and the scammers are going to use this technology. I mean, I'm already overwhelmed. Yeah. Uh, I had a guy hit me up on LinkedIn and... Uh, he was actually sending personal messages, I think, from the beginning. But I, I've got a dash in my name that I put uh, years ago. I had a dash and a red phone just to stand out on LinkedIn. Well, now I see how my name gets scraped and shared because I get all these messages. Hi, West Dash or hi, West Dash question mark because the phone wouldn't come over and they wouldn't they wouldn't clean their databases. So, but he finally sent a personal message and he said my name, right? Because I'm I'm so jaded. I know people, they'll send a message, you know, hi, I've been trying to reach you. I really love your work. Give me a call. They never say your name. So it's a generic message that they're just blasting to everybody. Uh, so, you know, is it just going to be like, okay, the, the early guys get in, all right, they make, a, they make a little bit of money, then it becomes normal. And now, because, you know, 20 years ago, if you were good at email marketing, you made a mint. Now it's like, okay, well, you have to be good at email marketing just to be open. You know, so like, where are we going? Well, I definitely think one of the best places for, for most people to start is to use it to help with their own content and, and marketing. Because to your point, you have to be good at that. And that's kind of a, a, a foundational piece of any business. And so I know a lot of businesses struggle just putting out proper content um, in a consistent way. And now, I mean, it's it, it's a little too easy, but why not leverage it? It was also easy, by the way. Think about it. People have been automating content for a long time. Do you know how? They've been paying some other random person or company to write it. That's automation. It's human-powered automation. Well, it, it's at least outsourced. That. It's outsourcing. It's outsourcing, <laughs> yes. Maybe a better use of that word. But, but you know, but it's happening automatically for you. Someone writes a blog every two weeks and they're doing it with human power. But in, in terms of your experience, someone's automating that process for you. And so that's already happening. It, it's not like every CEO is writing their own blogs every week. Um, I mean, I do, of course, but uh, no, I don't. But um, but I, I would leverage it to, to say, hey, hey, GPT, Please help me write a blog. Um, here, here's my kind of rough draft of it. Help me write it and make it more beautiful and, and call out the important points and uh, you know anything else that's important. So, I, and it can just get people from, it can get people 90% of the way there pretty quickly. And then people can spend their time uh, refining, tuning, fine tuning um, from there, as well as you know putting in links and stuff to other articles and stuff within you know backlinking. And so, I think that's a really powerful way to use it. We're using it to to write marketing emails to customers. You know, we will say, "Hey, we want to write an email promoting this feature and these three bullet points in 250 words," um, and it'll just get us 80, 90 percent of the way there. And then our team can spend most of their time fine tuning that and and refining it and getting it ready to go. Sometimes it can sound a little off, a little GPT ish. So that's that's where it gets you 80%, 90% of the way there. But that's that's a hell of a way to get you in in seconds. And I think that's how people should start to leverage it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what are you doing differently than others? Like how does Verse.io, who's it helping and how? So what we've been doing that's just really different is is we're we've been bringing the power of, of conversational AI to the the most powerful communication channel in the world, which is texting. And texting is its own animal, its own unique beast of complexity, uh, compliance, regulatory environment. 
um, people can't just do that at scale, no matter what AI has to offer. It's not about the AI. It, it's about the texting infrastructure, infrastructure. And that is a whole other beast. And so we have built uh, you know, carrier relations and the complexity around texting asynchronously at scale, being able to send millions of messages a day for multiple brands, the largest brands in America, um, and having two-way conversations that are powered by AI and backed up by humans uh, as and when needed. And, and that's really powerful. And so what we really do is we're an AI-powered customer engagement platform, and we help businesses connect with their customers through two-way texting. Um, and so if you have a big brand, um, a big solar company, let's say, and you have a lot of people going on there and searching uh, you know, sun power, uh, I, I want to quote for, for solar for my house, um, this is a national brand. How do they do this at scale? You know, where we can, we can automate the engagement of prospects and say, hey, Wes, thanks for you know, inquiring about solar here with sun power. Would love to get you a quote. Uh, let me ask you a couple of quick questions first. Um, first, you'll own your home. Great. Can you confirm the address? Great. What's your average electric bill today? Great. Awesome. Um, sounds like we might be helpful here. When's a good time for our installer to come out, uh, assess your roof and angles, and give you a quote on site, and then book that appointment? All of this can be automated asynchronously at scale 24-7 for big brands uh, like SunPower and others. We're also working with uh, universities and 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 homes, all sorts of home service companies, mortgage, real estate, insurance, uh, healthcare, really everywhere, um, and and law firms. But another example here, a uh, uh, University uh, of Pepperdine um, is is a customer. We have a great case study uh, we did with them, and they had trouble getting a hold of students. Their enrollment teams have trouble getting a hold of interested students. Why? Because nobody's answering the phone anymore, especially young, younger people. Uh, in fact, 87% of phone calls are completely ignored nowadays. So that's across the board, and that's even higher with the young, younger cohort. Uh, what, what, what percentage? 80, 87? 87% of phone calls are, are not answered. Wow. Um, but 98, 98% of text messages are read. 90% of text messages are read within three minutes. And so it's just it's just a complete game changer. But I mean, but I guess the, the assumption is they've opted in somewhere, right? Because oh, if yeah. you text me cold, I'm like I'm going ham on you. We don't do any. That's that's illegal. That's not right. compliant. Uh, we don't do any of that. That's why we work with brands with first party data with leads that are that are inquiring, raising your hand, saying I want information. Uh, I want a quote. Uh, we don't deal with spam. Those guys are all going to get sued into uh, uh, non existence, and they should be. Um, because they're hurting the industry um, as a whole, just like robocallers and others. So we're, we, we look at this as how do we help the biggest brands leverage the best communication channel, do it efficiently with AI um, to engage more prospects more efficiently and create a better experience. So University of Pepperdine was having trouble getting a hold of students and they hired Verse to text with prospective students who are inquiring and to qualify them a bit and set them up to speak to enrollment counselors. Yeah. And that enrollment counselors can spend their time on the phone with students that are ready to talk instead of trying to chase them down all, all over the place. Yeah. Um, so trying to think, like most folks have, or at least have seen some kind of chat window on a website. You know, HubSpot has a very good chat window with the, it can be, and it's automated, and you you build out the whole if then, and and I've built out some some yeah. very wide and deep uh, if then sort of dialogues for companies, um, and so I mean you're doing the same thing, but like you're how quickly are you getting people in into text? Because obviously, when when that chat goes, you know somewhere at the appropriate time, we're trying to get their contact info. If you ask too soon. You know, that kind of turns them off. If you ask for their number too soon, it turns them off. And and this will store their the conversation in in the CRM. Um, but like how what's the workflow, right? Because if I'm if I'm on my computer right now and and I hit that chat window, I'm on my computer. It's not a text conversation. I don't want to have a text conversation. I want to I'm on my computer. I want to have sure. 
chat conversation on my desktop. So how, how do you merge those, blend those? Well, we, we believe it's all about giving consumers choice to communicate how they want on their time, on their terms, on their preferred method of communication. 90% of people do prefer to text with a business as opposed to phone calls. Live chat is a whole other angle. However, live chat tends to be a really frustrating experience for most consumers as evidenced by statistics and their own reviews of it um, for a couple of reasons, and, and I'll explain them. And I'm not saying every company does this wrong, but the reason it's tricky is you do not get the consumer's information on a, on a chat widget until the very end, usually. And so, and there's a ton of drop off um, in between because they're just trying to get a hold of somebody. It's like, it's like an operator. You're just trying to get a hold of somebody and, and start a conversation. And they make you keep clicking two, three, if you this, four. And a lot of bots like Drift and others, they have that same experience. And so it's really a form over a, a chat widget. Um, but people can get frustrated and leave. And, and at the moment they close that tab, they're gone forever. There's no way to keep nurturing that prospect. So what we did to solve for that experience is we, we launched just last year um, something called Verse Capture. And it's our first live chat experience that brings a conversation to text. And so what it does is it lives on the bottom right of your site, just like the live chat, familiar live chat experience. But when you click it, the, the call to action on it is, we'll you know, text with us now, text with this business now. And so what it's doing is it's giving consumers the choice to say, hey, I'd rather, I'd rather just start talking to this business um, now. And so it pops open and instead of starting to have a form over chat, which is inauthentic, it actually asks for the user's information. And now they have a reason to put it in because if they wanna text with the business, well, obviously we need their phone number. So now we actually have a great reason to get their phone number and, and people input it on there. And then we take that conversation over to the text experience and have the same conversation that you would want to have over the phone or a chat bot, but over an authentic text conversation. And now we can take the conversation with them wherever they go. Um, and they could be leaving that moment to go pick up their kids and we didn't lose that conversation. We can keep it going. They can respond 30 minutes later if they need to, but we can keep the conversation going. And we have seen, and we have, we have uh, uh, case studies on this too on our site, but we have seen, our customers have seen 20 to 30% lift on page conversion rates by adding verse capture as a call to action to you can text with this business now, as opposed to um, chatting on, on different um, kind of embedded uh, widgets. Yeah, that's cool. So, I mean, you mentioned big brands, universities, can small businesses do this? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but we want to focus on, on, on brands. So it can be a, uh, a, a, a local HVAC company. We work with, with a lot of them. Um, it could be a local flooring company or a regional flooring company. Um, but the idea is, is we want to represent the brand um, so that when we engage with, with US, when you, um, you know, we have a, a, a case study with express flooring, big flooring company, um, you, you want to engage with the brand and, and we want to be able to reach out and say, hey, Wes, you know, we're reaching out here from Express Flooring, received a request for a quote, uh, when's a good time to, to, to come out and take a look at, at your home? Um, so we want, to have, we want to lead through that conversational experience um, and we don't want to deal with like arbitrage in that kind of world. Right. Were you helping them create the scripting and the verbiage? Um... Most people, not just companies, but I mean, companies are made up of people. <laughs> Most are terrible. The conversations are bad. The languaging yeah. is bad. The the if then the variables, you know, it's like I've I've never well, had a niche, right? Well, and what people, company has ever hired a conversation designer? I, I know. No, I mean, well, we do, right? Because that's what, uh, we do. and so we have we have a team of conversation designers that 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 literally. Just like you would design a beautiful website and hire someone to design a beautiful interface, we design a beautiful customer conversation experience. Um, and, we, and we have templates and all of that that we work off of, but we can also build them from scratch. But they, companies come to us and they, what we say is, tell us what you're trying to accomplish. What is the goal of the conversation? Is it to get, get someone on the phone? Is it to get someone uh, out to their home to do an at-home inspection? Is it to book an appointment or a demo? Uh, is it to qualify them and move them down funnel to some other step? 
what is the goal? What are the qualifying questions in between? And then we use our experience to deliver what we believe would be the, the, the most frictionless, uh, you know, beautiful, delightful experience to get someone from point A to B. And then we actually will A-B test it, we will review it, uh, and, and we will optimize it over time, just like you would optimize, you know, a, a site. Uh, we do this the same with the conversation flow. Do they, do they have uh, demographics, metrics on, on demographics? Like, uh, are older folks doing this as well? Is it better if, if your audience, your customers are younger? You know, 10 years ago, maybe, but nowadays, it, it, I mean, we have seen time and time again, the demographic gap is, is almost non-existent at this point. Um, it, 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 it's almost non-existent. I mean, this is even being used for senior healthcare, for senior living. We work with some of the largest senior living communities in, you know, in, in a country, um, and people just simply prefer, prefer to text, and, and, and they're okay texting. Even if they text, I prefer to call or give me a call. And we do that on our texting. We say, do you, is texting okay? Or do you prefer a call? And if they prefer a call, that's fantastic. And we can, we can drive them directly to the company um, to have a phone call instantly with this, with this person. But this is a person who 87% of the time would not have answered the call off the bat. And so right. we say the best time to, to call is text because you want to text first and say, Hey, Wes, Happy to give yes. you a call. When's a good time for you? That's right. a way better experience, believe it or not, than just calling you from a number you don't know that you're like, who is this? Why should I answer it? What what black hole am I about to enter if I answer this? Yeah. As opposed to a quick text that's like, hey, you know, this is Bob from ABC Remodeling. You know, when's a good time to give you a call? So, all right. Works in all demographics. Works with pretty much all industries. Uh, or is email going away? You know, are they still pulling them into that? Um, I mean, obviously you got to deliver more information. I mean, thing, PDFs, things like that. Contracts can't be sent uh, over a text. Yeah. Uh, you know, so do you have recommendations on like when to start plugging in additional mediums? Yeah, you know, we we always say, even if you're calling, you can keep calling if you have the resource to do, to do it. Um, you should be emailing too. But if you're leaving out the most popular engagement channel, you're definitely just leaving a lot on the table. And I would say the same to you in terms of um, if you're advertising, should you only advertise on Google because it's the best one? Or should you also have some budget, even if smaller, allocated to Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn and Bing and Yahoo? Right, it's it's about diversification. But if you're missing Google, well, you're missing the biggest channel, and that's what we're saying is don't miss the biggest channel. Now, in terms of customer experience, it really depends. But email is incredibly important once a relationship is formed, and even for some, you know, people should definitely be using email to drip content. Why not? Very cheap, very easy to do. Um, but but only 22% of emails are open. That's the stats on emails. It's 13% of phone calls are answered. That's why 87% missed. 22% of emails are opened. 98% of texts are opened. So it's four, four and a half times, you know, better to, to text that same thing. But to your point, there's certain things <laughs> you're not going to want to text. You're going to want to email, but you can even send a text saying, hey, check your email. I just sent you the contract. And that's so going to get say, that 22% up to 60. Yeah. So when you say 22% of emails are opened, is that um, just all emails? I mean, I got to okay. imagine once a relationship established, that's got to be 90%. Yeah. M marketing emails. Okay, marketing, that's okay. what I'm saying. When, once you have the relationship, totally move it to email. That's a, that's a very common way businesses you know, communicate. I communicate with, with vendors and customers all the time through email. Um, yeah. It's an important medium. So how are you growing now? How are you getting the attention of big customers to, to give you a chance? So, you know, we, we focus um, on certain size companies and certain industries. And so our team, uh, you know, goes after them more specifically, uh, you know, in a targeted approach, not, not, not such a wide net. And so we have kind of target lists 
of companies we're trying to get a hold of. We go to specific events where they're going to be at and we can network with them. We work with important partners and affiliates and, and different channel partners that and CRMs that work with all those kinds of businesses that we can tap into and, and, and create connections with. Um, we do podcasts um, and uh, all sorts of other things. And we do email marketing as well. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Um, multimedia, multi-step, huh? A absolutely. And we do ads and, you know, we, we try to put out value and content uh, on LinkedIn and, and social media as well and, and share what we know uh, with others so that they can make changes directly themselves or, or decide to partner with a company that can help accelerate those efforts. So for those targeting big companies, like I, I don't target big companies. Um, if, but as a, a verse partner, I might, <laughs> right? Um, what are you saying that's working? Is, is it just, is it old school uh, prospecting, you know, be creative, be persistent and, and get there? Cause like, I can't see the, a VP of marketing of a major company uh, falling in love with a TikTok channel and reaching out, you know, but then again, I'm old, I get it. But, so, but I don't know, like, is it, is it still old school? Put out the content for validation. So when you do reach out and they, they start to, because the first thing I do when somebody hits me up, I, I'm Googling them. I'm checking out their LinkedIn. I'm seeing what are they posting? Okay. Uh, I'm seeing something here that I like. And then if they're persistent, if I'm in true need, okay, I'll reach out. If But if they're persistent, I'm like, okay, I'll give this guy a shot. Um, is that kind of still the process? Yeah, you know, I think the biggest difference is figuring out who the decision makers are. That's the biggest difference it, it, in pitching small or big. And and by the way, we do work with smaller companies too. We just have certain minimums. And so they have they can be small and regional, but they have to have a, uh, enough customers that they're generating volume. Or, yeah. or volume of prospects per month to, for it to make sense to hire a platform like Verse. But um, when they're a smaller regional, you might be trying to actually get a hold of the owner, right? Um, who's usually they don't have a separate marketing team, you know, um, they may, uh, but, but that's the trick. Uh, but it's a smaller circle of people, of influencers that, you know, the decision makers are trying to get a hold of. Um, the bigger the company, the more angles you have to work at the same time to try to get the attention of decision makers eventually. And right. that sell cycle is way longer. Um, sometimes you get lucky and you get right in touch with the VP of marketing and, and they hear you out and they say, actually, this is a huge initiative of ours is how to leverage SMS, how to leverage AI. We know we're not getting a hold of a lot of people. Um, and sometimes it's it's going, you know, kind of stepping your way there. And it takes patience, it takes uh, persistence, creativity, um, and a unique message that's going to stand out because that person is also getting bombarded with other kinds of messages of things they don't need. And so how do you stand out and make sure that it piques someone's interest and attention? And it's definitely not easy, um, or everyone would be a billion dollar company hasn't signed up everyone they, they're trying to get the attention of. Um, but it doesn't take that many to build a big business um, yeah. once you get a hold of the right people. And you can start to build momentum. Once you have one big customer in a market, it's easier to get the next one and the next one and the next one because you can use that as a use case and say, hey, we're working with one of your biggest competitors. Um, they're leveraging this. What are you doing to solve for the same problem? Uh, perhaps we can be helpful. Yeah. Um, are you seeing signs of a recession? Uh, are people still... No. Quite the contrary. And tools that they need. Quite the contrary. I mean, I think there were a lot of fears of that happening, but uh, I mean, just just a week or two ago, uh, we officially entered a bull market again. Um, home home uh, home construction is surging. Lennar, biggest home builder in America, just reported um, you know some of the largest growth ever that they've ever had and the most demand. And so, even with interest rates the way they are, and they've started to dip a little, they're still really high but they've started to soften, the demand is still there. And when you look at you know, home construction, it tends to be one of the biggest indicators of kind of the trickle down of what's gonna happen. And so I think there are industries like refinancing, which are likely to, to be down for, for many years because everyone refinanced at 3%, give or take. So now 
it's going to be hard to get to a place where someone wants to refi at five and a half or six and a half percent. You have to have been at a really bad place to have to refi there. Um, so I think there are markets that will suffer longer than others, but yeah, you know, the economy seems to be uh, bouncing back uh, pretty strong. Yeah, and and uh, you know the jobs reports are are stronger than anyone uh, has predicted uh, many months in a row now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you and I are both in Southern California. I, I'm not seeing much of a slowdown. Restaurants are full. The malls are full. When I drop my kids off, I don't go to the mall. <laughs> you know, wages got increased. I, I mean, every company, just about every company increase wages over the last few years to keep up with inflation. So yes, inflation has taken a bite, but companies have kind of been pressured to increase wages in tandem. Um, yeah. and so overall, I don't think the impact has been as hard felt as if people hadn't received some of those wage increases. At the same time, inflation is softening, so that's helping. Um, and wages don't go down when that happens. They stay where they're at or keep going up. Yeah, very cool. So I'm going to have a link to the site, but it's verse.io, right? Verse.io. All right. Any any parting words, anything I should have asked? Well, be the change you want to see in the world. Yes. <laughs> nice. And start texting your customers, fool. <laughs> exactly. If you don't want to get a bunch of cold calls from companies, do the same for your own customers. Uh, send them an authentic, responsible, respectful text that that they prefer um, to get their attention. And and don't yeah. just bombard them with 50 phone calls until you hopefully get a hold of them when they're upset that, that yeah. you've them that many times. So be the change. Text the change you want to see in the world. Or or mail me bourbon, right? That, that gets the attention. That too. That too. I also will accept uh, those donations. It's just a little more expensive, but... Very cool. All right, man. Well, David Tall, thanks for coming back on the show. It was great catching up with you. Likewise, Wes. Thank you for having me. Cheers. All right, man. Have a good one. You too.